What a uh, beautiful evening to worship together. A preview of what we will do as we just sang forever and ever and ever. Worship King Jesus. Um, such a joy to be able to worship with you tonight. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church, and um, I know we have many guests, many uh, family in from out of town, friends that have joined us perhaps for the first time, and I just want to say Merry Christmas to you. We're so glad uh, that you are here with us, worshiping with us, um, exalting in Jesus with us. As you uh, heard read um, so beautifully by the Martin family, we are looking at prophecies. We just, you heard them read from Isaiah chapter 7, and through this this Advent season, we have been looking at prophecies that point to, that tell us who Jesus is, that tell the story of who King Jesus is. And we've been doing that to prepare our hearts because Jesus is a God who we can know. And we can know him through the scriptures. And we look at these scriptures and we look back at these stories and we can understand who Jesus is. I want to invite you, if you don't know who Jesus is, you're in the perfect place. You came because your mom, your grandma, your dad, your uncle, your friend said, hey, please come with me to worship. And you were kind enough to join them in that. You were in the perfect place because you are going to leave this evening fully aware of who Jesus is, I hope. If you have questions about that, I wanna invite you. On the screen behind me, you'll see a number and a, a word to text. Text the word Emmanuel to 97000. You can even do that right now or anytime throughout our service or maybe later tonight. As you consider Jesus and you think to yourself, I'm not sure about this. I've got a question that I'd like to talk with someone about. Text that number and confidentially, one of our ministers will follow up with you after the new year. We'd love to talk with you more about who Jesus is because he is worthy of our worship. Um, we are looking at these prophecies, primarily looking back because in our church, a normal season of life in our church, we've been working our way through the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 16, Paul, it says, like he often did, went into the synagogue and he went to people who thought they knew who God was, wanted to worship God, and he went into the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jewish people that were there to worship God from the scriptures to explain to them who Jesus was. They, he didn't want them to miss the Messiah. And so we've been looking at these in the same way Paul went and reasoned from the scriptures. We have been looking at these Old Testament prophecies to reason from the text. Who is Jesus and why do we worship him? Well, that prophecy that we read, you heard read from Isaiah chapter 7, was quoted at Jesus' birth or just preceding Jesus' birth. In Matthew chapter 1, we read the story of Jesus' birth and just before he arrived, Joseph who has been betrothed to Mary, believes that he must divorce her because now he has found out that she is pregnant. And because of that, he thinks, I've got to divorce her. And so the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph in a dream and he speaks to Joseph and he says, Joseph, don't divorce her. Trust God. These are the words of the angel. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now you're thinking to yourself, that's the same words that I heard the Martin family read, and you're exactly right. Matthew is quoting, the angel of the Lord recorded for us in Matthew, is quoting the great prophet Isaiah hundreds of years earlier, where Isaiah spoke to a king, a king named Ahaz, and he told King Ahaz, God told King Ahaz through Isaiah, that he was going to remove him from the authority. King Ahaz had failed at his job to be the right kind of king on David's throne, and he had not fulfilled all that God wanted him to do. And so God said, I will take care of this myself. I will send a king who will sit on David's throne and he will be Emmanuel. He will be God with us. And when we think about this prophecy, this gift, God with us, Emmanuel, this answers, solves for us, really our greatest challenge in life. 
One way or another, every single one of us has tried to figure out or is trying to figure out how can we be right with God? How can we be reconciled to God? You may not have thought of it, the question in those terms, but you've thought to yourself, I want peace in this life. I want to have hope in this life. I want to be settled before God. I don't want to be condemned by God. And in some way, you're trying to make your way to God. Every one of the world religions is essentially trying to answer the question, how can human beings have peace? How can they have hope? How can they have a future? How can they be saved? All of those questions are asked in every single of the world religions, what they demand is that we as human beings figure it out enough to work our way to God. Only in Christianity does God come to us. Only in Jesus does God come to dwell with us. And this is why he is the answer to our greatest problem, our greatest question. How can you have meaning in life? How can you have hope in this life? All of again, these are attempts to answer that question. We can have that through Jesus, who came to be like us, humbled himself, as Philippians chapter 2 says, so that he could be with us. And here's the beauty of that statement. It says that he humbled himself. He became like us. And we think of Jesus, of course, in the manger as a baby, and he becomes small. But when he becomes small, do you know what he does for us? He is proving how great he sees you to be, his love for you. He is magnifying us as human beings as he's saying, they are worth my life. They are worth me humbling myself and becoming small because they are big. His love for you is big. Remember those words, Christmas means God loves you that you heard deed and read. That's exactly what it means. Jesus came to show you how much he loved you, to show you how much God values your life. And so when we look at this prophecy, we can see so much about who Jesus is and why He's worthy of our worship for every day of our life. Let's look closely. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The first thing when we see when Isaiah speaks these words, God speaks these words to us, he says that the Lord will do this. The Lord is the one who is doing a great thing. Again, so often when we think of God, we think to ourselves, we've got to figure something out to make our way to God. And what God does immediately through this prophecy is he flips that on his head. He says, it's not about what you do at all. It's about what I will do. The Lord will do this himself. He is the one who moves. He does this, if you notice, without any requirement. This is not one of those if-then statements that we so loved in algebra. Some of you loved algebra, not me. If you do this, then this will happen. No, God says, I will do it. Not contingent upon what you will do. I am the one who will do this. And in this statement, we see right off the bat why the gospel of Jesus Christ is better than Santa Claus. Now, I love Santa kids. Don't get all upset at me right now. But the gospel of Jesus is even better because here's what we know to be true. Santa has a naughty and nice list, doesn't he? God, according to God, we are all on the naughty list. (gasps) I know, like Elf. (gasps) Thank you for that. $3 to that young man. Okay, now they're all going to do it. Miss Jessica has not taught me well. I'm still learning how I'm not supposed to react to the children. (laughs) Be honest with yourself. When we analyze our own lives, when we're honest with ourselves, we know, I'll just tell you right here, as one of the persons leading this church called to proclaim God's word to you, I confess to you that I'm on the naughty list. There is so many things about my life that God would be right and just to condemn me for. But here's the beauty. God himself says, I won't because I love him. He flips it on its head. And there's no requirement for me to figure that out on my own. He is the one who moves. In spite of the fact of what I know about my own heart, what I know about my own life, in spite of all those things, God says, I will give you the gift of grace, grace which you undeserve, grace that will be with you for all of your life, grace that will secure eternity for you. This is what Jesus does. The Lord will give you a sign. He will do it himself. He then says, That you will see this, you will prove this out. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. And in the virgin birth, we see that it is the Lord and it could only be the Lord because only God could do that. 
There's no human way possible for Jesus to be born of a virgin. God had to intervene. God is the one who did that work, and it proves the miraculous nature. Some people in the world think that Jesus is just a prophet. Some think of him as a good teacher. Some think of him as maybe a righteous man, a holy man, somebody that is worth emulating, somebody who's worth trying to kind of follow. But what Jesus says about himself, I am God, God himself with us. The miraculous nature, his birth, proves that he is God. And here's the thing that we can know about God. God is eternal, and it's because he is God, because he is eternal, that he can give any one of us eternal life. Eternal is a big word. It's hard for me to even get my mind around that. But here, let me just give you a picture of eternal. You cannot find a past anywhere in the past. You can't go far enough back in the past to find a beginning. You cannot go anywhere far enough in the future to find an end. Eternal means forever and ever, no beginning and no end. That is God. That is who Jesus is. Jesus didn't arrive when he just came to the manger. Jesus was eternal. He is eternal. And because he is eternal, guess what he can give to you? eternal life. I'm a man. I have no ability to give you eternal life. I can point you to the one who can give you eternal life. I can tell you about who he is, but I cannot give you eternal life. No man can do that because only one who possesses eternal life can give eternal life. Jesus in the miraculous virgin birth proves that he is God and proves that he is able to give you eternal life. That's why he came. And how does he do that? The prophet continues, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He will do that by becoming like us, being a son, becoming a man, God and man, fully God and fully man. Yes, he came as a son. The created one who created us in the image of God came, took on that image and came to be like us. You know, this is why we have the genealogies in our Bible. I know some of you have skipped over those many times in your Bible reading plans. You come to Matthew chapter one, and you're like, here's a whole list of names. I can't pronounce them. I'm not sure where they're from. Why is this even in the Bible? You come to Luke chapter three, you see another genealogy of Jesus, and you're wondering to yourself, why is this in here? Do you want to know why it's in there? It's to prove that Jesus is in the line of David, and Jesus traces his lineage all the way back to the first man, Adam. We see both of those in those genealogies. Matthew chapter 1, 1 says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It proves that Jesus was, yes, a man, and he could trace his line all the way back. He was the rightful heir to the throne of David. He was a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant when God made a promise to Abraham. He, yes, could trace his line even all the way back to Adam, the first man. He came as a son And because of that, because he was fully man and yet fully God, he could atone for sin. He could take on sin and atone for it. He could lay down his life on a cross and pay the final penalty for sin once and for all because he was a man. This is what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers, like us in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That big word propitiation, don't get hung up on it, here's all it means. He made the final and complete payment for the sins of the world. That's what Jesus did. And he could do that because he was a man. And he proved, God proved, that he accepted Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, my sins and yours, when he said, sit down at my right hand. There's no more payment to be made. There's two things that you need to know about that. Some of you who've been around City Church for a little while, you know this already. You've heard this message before. You can't figure out your own way to God and you don't have to. Jesus made the final payment for sin. You don't need to make another payment because you can't. And that's a beautiful thing. The other piece of that story and the beautiful thing of that story is the fact that Jesus is familiar with your suffering, with the trials of this life. He is a high priest who is empathetic. He came and was like us and faced all of the same temptations, all of the trials that you face, whatever it is that you're struggling with. I know the holiday season for some of us comes with grief, with pain, with hurts that you can't even speak out loud. 
And you have a high priest in King Jesus who is so familiar with that. And he loves you. And he laid down his life to heal that brokenness. And it might not be healed in this life. I'll just tell you that. It might be healed when you meet him face to face. But it will be healed. Because that's what Jesus does. Finally, the prophet says, you shall... Excuse me, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. And he came that he might fix everything that was broken by sin. Let me give you the whole story of scripture in about 15 seconds. In the garden... God created the heavens of the earth and God and man dwelt perfectly together. There was nothing breaking the fellowship between God and man. And then sin entered in the world and God had to kick Adam and Eve out of the garden and because he could not, in his holiness, could not be present with sin, they were removed and there was a brokenness that became between God and man. There became enmity between God and man. And God then began to unfold his plan of redemption, which was to send his son, Jesus, to come as the God-man, to come and be like us so that he could go to a cross and lay down his life for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And Jesus did that and he sat down at the right hand of the Father and then he sent the Holy Spirit to spread this message of hope all over the globe. And for 2,000 years, that message has been proclaimed and preached all over the world and the world has been turned upside down as the church has been lit aflame and spread that message of hope. And because he is God with us, soon, just as he came that first Christmas, he's going to come again. And do you know what's going to happen? Just as it was in the beginning, God and man will dwell together. Look at Revelation 21. Revelation 21, Revelation, the book of Revelation, tells us how things will end up. Do you want to know the end of the story? Revelation 21, verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be as their God. That's what Jesus came to do. He's in the process of making all things new. We invite you tonight, this Christmas, and every time we are together to worship that Jesus, to put your faith in that Jesus. I hope you'll believe in him tonight. I hope you will know the God who is with us. We lit the first candle. We now get to light the final candle, the Christ candle. And the Christ candle reminds us that the light has come. And where there is light, the darkness cannot overcome it. The light of Christ is with us forever and ever. We're going to sing of his worthiness to worship him for who he is. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this night. We thank you that you are God with us. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that if there's anyone who has any doubts, questions, or confusion about who you are, Jesus, may you clear that up even now. We want to worship you, Jesus, because you are worthy, because you are Emmanuel, God with us. Let's stand and worship. Amen.